So, hello everyone. This is Sean Taylor, field application scientist from BioRad in Canada, and we're very happy to announce the release of this new article that we've just published in the Journal of Molecular Microbiology and Biotechnology, entitled "The State of RT-qPCR First-Hand Observations of MIQ Implementation." So, I'm going to walk you through this quickly. Basically, this article is a very short. A uh, four or five page article that will walk you through the key experimental design steps to produce really solid data for a qPCR experiment that will conform to the key criteria of the MIQE guidelines. So, let me quickly walk you through this. First of all, just a primer. Um, the MIQE guidelines were published in Clinical Chemistry in 2009, and they were published by the very notable authors that you see in front of you here. And the reason why this paper was published was to provide a method for consistency in publishing data uh, for qPCR. These authors um, have been very uh, forthright in the scientific community to show that a lot of experiments that have been published in the literature um, not only uh, don't conform to any guidelines for experimental design, but because of that have generated uh, potentially artifactual data in many of these articles, leading people astray in uh, building on the literature and it published with qPCR. So um, following that paper, uh, myself and some other co-authors um, wrote an article called The Practical Approach to RT-QPCR, Publishing Data that Conforms to the MIQE Guidelines. This article was published in Methods uh, the year after the original MIQE paper. I would recommend that you read this article as well as the original article um, to give yourselves uh, a really good solid background as to how to design um, experiments uh, in QPCR that will give you good data, data that you can rely on at the end. I'd also recommend that you read the uh, current article that I'm talking about, which is the state of RTQPCR. This this is a really nice short article that will help you. So let me walk you through experimental design very quickly for a qPCR experiment according to this recent publication. So first of all, um, as we all know, designing a qPCR experiment involves several steps, and we start by treating a sample. Uh, this is particularly geared towards a gene expression experiment. Uh, after sample treatment, this would follow the RNA extraction and purification step, uh, following the analysis of the RNA, and then the reverse transcription uh, reaction, so converting your RNA to cDNA, followed by the uh, qPCR step, obviously on the cDNA, where you analyze the data using what's called the delta-delta CT method which would be normalized gene expression relative to, uh, uh, in, the, in this day and age, it's at least to two or three uh, reference genes. And then um, this would follow back to sample treatment for a, for, for a second experiment or if you're optimizing experiments. So um, here is a, um, an experimental design table that I generally present in all my trainings that I give for qPCR. It's just a nice one pager to show you how to design an experiment. Follow uh, where you follow some very straightforward steps, but all of these steps are, 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 are completed at your desk before going into the lab. Things like experimental procedure, where you list the disease or treatment groups you're going to be using, the target genes that are implicated in your study and potential reference genes that you're going to be using. Uh, control groups, what are your control groups that you're using in this study? Is it T equals zero? Is it normal? Is it untreated? and the number of biological replicates, i.e. different biological sample. A liver from mouse one, mouse two, and mouse three would denote three biological replicates. And then how many technical replicates you're going to be doing as well, which would denote the same cDNA <coughs> derived from a biological sample that you would pipette into multiple wells on a qPCR plate. As I note here, these first three steps um, are the experimental parameters, the goals, uh, and the samples that you're going to be using based on the literature, um, and presumably um, data from uh, a broad microarray or proteomics experiment or, or some of some such sort, where you've defined these parameters based on 
previous work uh, that's been done using some other form of experimental data. Following the, the definition of these first three groups, you get into experimental conditions and sample handling. And some examples of experimental conditions would be growth conditions, days, of, days or even hours of embryonic development, amount per mass of drug or compound, sex or phenotype, incubation time, incubation temperature. It's important to list and control all the controllable factors in your experiment because the transcriptome is very sensitive <coughs> to potential changes in uh, your experimental design. So it's very, very important to assure that when you, when you conduct an experiment that you try to control all of these factors so that the final outcome of the experiment is the result of the biology that you've introduced, your own treatments that you're introducing between your sample groups and not because of a temperature difference between, between incubations or potentially uh, a drug that was uh, much more potent from one lot from a company than from a different lot. Finally, sample handling is also something that needs to be considered the precise time to harvest cells or tissues, the sample extraction method uh, that, you, that you would use, uh, the preservation time and method for samples, thawing homogenization procedure, and finally the total RNA extraction procedure. And these, these are all detailed very nicely in this article, the state of RT-QPCR first-hand observations of MIQE implementation. So you can read more details about this in that article. Okay, so it's Important, and this is a new slide actually, something that I've been playing with in, in a lot of the trainings that I do, um, to be prepared when you're going to do an experiment. And by being prepared, I mean make a shopping list of your experiment. To make a shopping list, list the number of targets, or the, meaning genes that you intend on, on using, the number of treatments that you intend on testing, the number of time points, the number of bioreplicates in your study, and the number of technical replicates. And by listing the num these numbers down and then multiplying all the numbers against each other, you'll get a grand total number which is actually equates to the number of wells that you would require in a given experiment. That's an important number to have because that gives you the number of of, uh, of reagents and sample requirements that you would need for a given study. So by knowing this information, you can then order, for example, your cell culture medium from the same lot from a given company because you know how much cell culture medium you're going to need or how much compound or drug you intend on using to test your samples. You can order from the same lot. You'll also, of course, know from this, from the, from this total number value how much your experiment will cost by adding up the total number of reagents you'll need, and that'll give you an idea of whether you can even afford to do that kind of an experiment, or you need to pare it down a little bit. Okay, RNA isolation. Um, up here, the theme here is maintain the cold chain with frozen samples prior to RNA extraction. So it's important that your samples do not thaw before you extract the samples. Um, unless you've added some sort of RNA stabilizing agent into your samples. For example, with, with, with cell culture, often people will uh, lyse the cells directly on the plate using triazole or the RNA extraction buffer, and then the cells, then that homogenate is stabilized. Uh, some people use RNAs later with tissue uh, samples because they work in the field, and those tissues that have been perfused with the RNAs later are stabilized. Um, if, um, I recommend fresh frozen samples. I always recommend trying to stop transcription as fast as possible when you, when you uh, lye cells or, or extract tissue from an organism. So for tissue, I usually recommend um, um, uh, liquid nitrogen so that you, the samples are, are flash frozen so that transcription stops immediately. But then if you're using fresh frozen tissue, it's important that the, that the tissue remains as close to minus 80 as possible, so on dry ice, all through the process until you finally homogenize the tissue in the extraction buffer. I do recommend kits for doing uh, the RNA extraction. 
only because kits provide you with lot verified material that's not contaminated with RNAs, so you can you can rigorously extract RNA. Uh, Biorad sells kits as well as other companies um, that uh, that that are that are good kits, and you know you can talk to your local Biorad rep for for for, for recommendations with respect to what type of kit you would need for your particular type of sample. Um, once you've extracted the RNA, it's important to assure that the RNA is good. So you need to test two things, purity and the quality of the RNA. The purity is the OD260-280. So that's the ratio of nucleic acids, OD260, to protein, OD280. And that ratio defines the purity of your nucleic acid sample, meaning your RNA sample, with respect to protein contamination. And you would like this number to be greater than 1.8. Uh, that denotes a reasonably pure sample with, with, with limit, limited protein contamination. You also then want to look at quality. Purity does not equal quality. Quality is the level of degradation of your RNA sample. And as you see here, this was a heat degradation experiment that we did where all of the heated samples gave the same level of purity but the last three or four samples were fully degraded. So this, this is, what, is, is a, what would be a good looking sample where you have the 28S and 18S ribosomal RNA in a total RNA sample appearing quite prominently where the 28S band is more intense than the 18S band. And that's a very good sample. And as samples degrade, the 28S band eventually disappears and you get a smear on your gel as a degraded sample. Either purity or quality will lead to increasing and increasingly variable CT values. Um, and that will pose a big problem in getting good biological reproducibility and hence good p-values uh, in your studies. So it's important to test for these things with your RNA as a, as a, as a step in the process. Once you've tested your RNA and you've reverse transcribed to cDNA, it's important then to validate your primers. So we sh you should always validate primers, regardless of where those primer sequences have come from. It's quite important to assure that your primers are validated um, experimentally, uh, because a lot of primers that are published out there are published with either the wrong sequence or sequence to uh, a completely different target. So it's a good idea to do this, to blast your primers, and then to, to, to test them using a, a gradient to assure that you have the right annealing temperature for your primers, and then also with a standard curve um, to assure that the reaction efficiency is good with your samples in, and those primers. So a thermal gradient, you can do this on any BioRad instrument, actually, a qPCR instrument. And I, rec and I do recommend doing this by qPCR because it's more precise. And as you can see, you can split each row on a plate by a different temperature, which means on a given plate you could, you could test uh, duplicates of, of, uh, of each primer with your samples across, six, um, uh, across uh, six different primer pairs. There are 12 columns in a plate, so in duplicate you could test six primer pairs at eight different temperatures with a, with a given sample. I do recommend that for reaction validation, thermal gradient and standard curve that use a pooled cDNA sample from across all the conditions of your experiment. So that becomes your validation sample. And I recommend diluting that cDNA sample by about a factor of 10 or 20 uh, to make sure that you've diluted out any potential inhibitors of qPCR that might be in that sample. And then you use that as your reaction validation sample uh, for each uh, primer pair that you're going to be testing in a given experiment. So here, A and B gave no amplification because the annealing temperature was too high. C came up very late in amplification, above 35 CTs, which I really say is the maximum cutoff for qPCR. Again, annealing temperature just too high. The primers weren't binding well. D gives us a good uh, 22 CT value, um, but it's still right-shifted, as you can see from the other curves. And the more right-shifted you are in this experiment, the less optimized the annealing temperature. So 64 is not optimal because we're right shifted. We're higher CT than all the rest of the curves. And all the rest of the curves converge at the lowest CT, which in this case is 21 CTs, defining the optimal 
range of annealing temperatures for those particular primer pairs being from 54 to 60. Now, on you want to make sure that the lower temperatures are still good. So I would always run this amplification reaction, which is called a, a gradient, a thermal gradient reaction, with a melt curve so that you can check to see that at the lower temperatures in your optimal range, that you don't have multiple melt curve peaks, which would, which would indicate that your primers are now becoming nonspecific at these lower temperatures. So check the melt curve to make sure you have a single peak at the lower temperatures. Uh, in this case, we do. So that means we can work from 54 to about 60 degrees with those particular primer pairs. Now, if you run these primer pairs and you test, let's say, six primer pairs on a given plate in duplicate across eight temperatures, you're going to end up with different optimal ranges of annealing temperatures, slightly different for each individual primer pair. So what you would do then is you would pick the annealing temperature that's in common with all of the optimal ranges across all the primer pairs. And that would become your experimental annealing temperature. When you know that temperature, take the tape off the plate and then pipette at that optimal temperature the replicate wells onto a gel to confirm that your amplicons are running at the right molecular weight, which would indicate that you're amplifying the correct target, which is important, right? So what you've done in a single experiment for, for six primer pairs is you've tested the optimal range of annealing temperatures, the, the primer specificity, and the identity of your product. And that whole experiment for six primer pairs takes about an hour to run the qPCR experiment for six, for six primer pairs on the same plate and then about another hour to run the gel. So you're talking about two to three hours of work to, to fully optimize for annealing temperature, specificity, and identity six primer pairs, which is pretty good. Really what I'm trying to say here is that there's no excuse for not doing this kind of an experiment to assure that your primer pairs are working properly. Some groups will go as far as sequencing these as well to assure that the amplicons actually give the correct sequence. Okay. Now we know the correct annealing temperature to use for our primers because we've done the thermal gradient. At that annealing temperature, you need to test uh, by running a standard curve, which is a serial dilution series of that same pooled diluted cDNA sample. So you're going to dilute the cDNA sample in a serial dilution series. Okay? And I would rec recommend that the full dilution you use is primer dependent. So if your primers are low expressing primers, they come up above, let's say, 25 CTs, I would recommend using a two-fold serial dilution series for the standard curve, okay? And be very careful with your pipetting. If your primers are, are sort of medium expressors, they come up between around, I don't know, 18 and 25 CTs, I would recommend doing a four-fold serial dilution series. And if they come up below 18 CTs, I would recommend doing an eight-fold serial dilution series. And do an eight-point standard curve in triplicate at each point. So what will happen is you will get a nice standard curve using that same pooled cDNA sample for all the primer pairs, except in different serial dilutions, depending on the expression level of the primers. And that, this data here will convert to a nice standard curve that will look like this which will define the efficiency, the reaction efficiency of your primers in a representative sample, which is that pooled cDNA sample. You want your reaction efficiency to fall between 90 and 110 percent, which will, which will give you confidence that your primers are working very well in your own samples. But that reaction efficiency is defined by this series of dilutions that you've done with that pooled cDNA sample. So that means that I'm efficient within this range of dilutions of my DNA. So that means my unknowns, when I go to test all my unknowns with those primers, my unknowns need to all fit within this dynamic range, let's say from around 10 CTs to around 27 CTs for this particular primer pair. So what I would do is I would use my standard curves to dilute 
to figure out how to dilute my unknowns on a primer pair by primer pair basis. So in this case, let's say that this particular primer pair was a low expressor and I did a two-fold dilution series to, to get this standard curve. This would be uh, and this would be two-fold, four-fold, eight-fold. So maybe I would dilute my unknowns by a factor of, let's say, 10 or 20-fold or if this was the first point in my dilution series, okay? But if it was a medium expressor where it was a four-fold dilution series, that would be 4, 16, 64. I might dilute my unknowns by about, by about 100-fold to fall somewhere in the middle of the standard curve so that I have room for samples that increase in expression or decrease in expression to fit all on the same standard curve, all right? So that's how you use your standard curve. Standard curve is used to assure that reaction efficiency is good between 90 and 110 and that your unknowns all fall on the standard curve by diluting your unknowns per primer pair to the middle of each standard curve. And that means that on a primer pair by primer pair basis, you probably you will probably find that that your unknowns may need to be diluted differently depending on whether you have high expressor, medium expressor, or low expressor uh, targets. Okay, the last thing that you need to do when you do a, a qPCR experiment is select good reference genes. So um, choose a target by testing the stability. Uh, between the experimental conditions, and you should be testing multiple targets. So, so to do this, um, it's very well explained in this, uh, in this paper. I'm not going to go into the details, but just assure that you do do this. Um, and and um, it's also explained in uh, this article as well, the Nike case study, and these figures are actually taken from, from this particular article. It's a Biorad tech note that we published a couple of years ago. Technote 6245, just to show you the effect of poor reference gene or good reference gene selection. So in this case, we were looking at human breast cancer samples where each bar is a patient, and this is the normal patients, and these are the breast cancer patients where we were testing for MCM7 regulation between normal tissue and tumor tissue. Here we normalized by TBP and HPRT, which were, which were found to be stable reference genes. So we normalized by the average of TBP and HPRT in this particular study, and we found that we had a nice significant increase in expression between the green, the normal samples, and the red tumor samples with a p-value of 0 0.0007. So very nice and expected increase in regulation for MCM7 between normal and cancer. Here though, when we, when we used 18S to normalize, we had no significant difference in the average of the normal and the average of the treatment conditions. And when we used GAP-DH, we actually got the exact opposite effect. So, so the, the, now the normal samples look like they were increasing in expression for MCM7 and the treated sample and the cancer samples had a decrease. So you can see that by selecting inappropriate reference genes, you can go from having a, an expression difference in a certain direction to no expression difference to an expression difference in the exact opposite direction. So reference gene selection is really critically important for qPCR. As a matter of fact, all of the steps that I've explained are critical. They're all summarized and explained very clearly again in this, in this article, the state of RT qPCR, first time observations of MIQE implementation. Strongly recommend that you read that article. It's a nice short article, easy to read, with two tables at the end of it, the do's and don'ts of qPCR that you can post beside your instrument. So I hope this, was, this information was interesting and useful for you, and we'll be talking to you again.